morning. I have a few things to share this morning. Um, Matt, I'm going to go ahead and do that BVS thing, uh, but uh, I'll let you get that queued up. Uh, a couple of announcements that I want to share with you today. Uh, first of all, and maybe most importantly, it's Matt and Carrie's anniversary today. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure who we need to applaud more or uh, congratulate more or... <laughs> You two are so good together, and we are blessed to be, to share life with you. So congratulations to you on that. And there's no, yeah, <laughs> I know what that's like. Um, there's no song for your happy anniversary, so, but just the applause is, is appropriate for that. Um, also want to let folks know, I got them all on my little post-it note here that I folded over and now I can't read. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, had a good birthday. So thanks for the cards and all the well wishes. I appreciate that. Makes me feel good. Um, so thank you for those. Uh, some of you may have noticed a few things around the, the church building that are a little different. Some of the rooms have been uh, kind of sequestered off. We are hosting the Extreme Tour, which is part of what we do that uh, when we can, uh, when they come through, when their schedules coincide with ours. Uh, they are doing a good ministry out in the community connecting with young people, speaking to them the gospel in a language that they understand. Um, so when we sang our good old hymns this morning in early service and they were all here, I'm not quite sure how comfortable they were with those songs, but uh, it might be the same if we listen to the songs that they're sharing, the message is the same. And so I uh, just want to let folks know that they are here in the building till Tuesday? Okay, so they're going to be kind of in and out a little bit. Uh, do be praying for them as they travel, as they uh, share the gospel, that uh, people will be open and receptive to it. We did mention this last week. We are taking a free will offering. Uh, gas prices and everything have increased significantly, and so the cost of them doing the tour, which is largely self-funded, has gotten to be a little bit uh, challenging for them. So if you have cash, which is a lot easier for us to give them than checks, uh, there are little cans that have Extreme Tour, little, little plastic uh, containers out in the foyer, and we'd appreciate uh, you giving generously to their ministry uh, in doing that. Yes? Oh, new brakes on a van. So this is the kind of stuff that will come in very handy for them because they are... Let's be honest, they're shoestringing it a lot of times. And so, you know, this is, this is our way of uh, coming alongside their ministry and helping them out. Um, I've got another group that is kind of connected uh, to, they were going to be here today as well. There is a, a Brethren Voluntary Service Unit, um, Unit uh, 331, I believe. They have numbers. I don't know. It's pretty arbitrary. Um, but they're up at uh, Camp Stover, and they've uh, shared some pictures of the group. So this is the... This is the, the BVS unit that's at camp right now. Um, and I, I have their names and everything if you're interested in that. But there's a, a group of them that are from Germany. There's a group of them that are from different parts of the United States. They are training together and sharing with each other in this context. And then they're going to go out to a whole bunch of different uh, uh, service uh, uh, locations. Uh, Brethren Disaster Ministries. Uh, Adobe Family Services in Fremont, California, um, uh, 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 Rwanda, uh, Fremont again, Portland, uh, Japan, all over the place. They're going to be dispersing. And so we want to be praying for the uh, Brethren Voluntary Service and the, the, the folks that are going to be going out and doing these ministries. Um, they wanted to be here to share with you, but one of their group uh, came down with COVID. <laughs> And so everybody's like, oh, we're all having to kind of hang out until we determine where we're at on that. And so the symptoms are mild, but they do appreciate uh, the prayers on that. And just for a specific person, the gentleman in, go back, in the hat on the left is Dan McFadden. He's the director. Do be praying for him because he's, he's got to ride this thing. Um, so that's, a, that's a quite a responsibility that he has there. And so we want to be praying for them. But they're up at Camp Stover right now doing uh, various things. Clearing trail. Go ahead and hit those, Matt. So clearing trail and uh, threatening people with loppers. So, no. <laughs> they're having fun and doing that. So do be, do be praying 
for them as well. So, and uh, we are back on our regular uh, rotation. Thank you, Brittany, and all the folks that did a wonderful job with our VBS. We are grateful for all that you've done there. So, all right. <sighs> Carlene, could you be in our service today? Thank you. Good morning and welcome. This is my first time doing this. And I will share with you that the person that asked me is very effective in asking, so you all just be aware. <laughs> okay? It doesn't stop with me. All right. Um, you've noticed that you may or may not, obviously summer is here, but we're in the throes of the end of summer. Um, the flowers that are blooming right now, Jerry and I sat out last night and the sprinklers were going and it was under a shady tree and we're having nice cold water that was nice and icy and looked at it and there are the hostas blooming. There are the fall um, uh, cone flowers. Everything has pollen. It's just full of it. And here come the hummingbirds. Here come the monarch butterflies. And I thought to myself, would I see this if we didn't just stop and stop the mind noise and just be? And I think that that's so important in life right now. And particularly, you know, in the summertime, did you notice? Are you seeing many red-winged blackbirds out there anymore? Our feeders are full all the time. <laughs> That's how we know that they're gone. The robins, we don't have the robins that stay at our house year-round. They're gone. So everything is doing God's cycle. They come and they go. They all know what it is that they're supposed to be doing. And John's been teaching a session in this together and it's so good for me to be going through this with you and just being a part of this family of God. That's just so important. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together and letting us share and build this relationship that is so powerful that we too may go out and let our light shine in all that we do. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So, I also have good news. My scripture did not change this week. <laughs> I am, uh, I get um, Psalm 15, a Psalm of David, and it says it's guidelines for living a blameless life. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from the heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, who casts no slur on other, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing, Oh, let the Son of God enfold you.
For each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctant or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Lord, we thank you for these tithes and offerings, and we commit that we will put them to their intended use and support your name in glory in all it does and all we do. Amen. Miss doing stuff with the kids, because they've been down in the Bible study in the vacation Bible school, but now they're here, and I get to have a kid story again. So kids can come on up. Good morning. Just sit anywhere you're comfortable. Well, not anywhere, I guess. So, so. Um, you remember that? First of all, I have to say this. God is awesome. God is so cool. God does amazing things. It's wood. You think that's wood? Yeah. Well, check this out. Check it out. Check it out. A meteor. Oh, well, <laughs> it's interesting you would think that. This, do you remember what this is? What is it? A rock. 
It is a rock. Do you remember what kind it is? Huh? It's lava rock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it comes out and it flows like water. I don't know. We've been looking at stuff in Iceland and there's a volcano in Iceland that's erupting right now and all the lava is spreading out all over the place. Did you know that all the rocks around here are lava rocks? A whole lot of them are. Most of them. If you go over to Boise, you can get into some different kind of rocks. But here are these. And we were talking about it last Wednesday and I got all excited about rocks and things and I have to tell you about this. This is how God makes the world. He builds it out of rocks. Yeah, so you, the volcanoes come up and the lava spreads out and then it hardens into rocks. Yeah, but, but that's not, not the only kind of rock. This is a smaller piece of lava here. You guys can pass that around if you want. Yep. Oh, you got interested in that, didn't you? Yeah, well, well don't, don't, don't jump the gun yet. Okay. So this right here, this is another kind of lava rock. That one looks different than this one, right? And this one looks different than that one, but I want to show you something. I'm going to flip it over. Ready? What do you think of that? You know what this is? This is obsidian. Yes, it's like, it's what they call volcanic glass. And it comes out of volcanoes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very sharp. If you break it off a certain way, it can be very sharp. And, and Native Americans used to make like arrowheads out of this stuff. Yeah? You can pass that one through. That one's not sharp. That one got smoothed out. Now, that's not the only kind of rock there are either. See this one right here? This one, you see how it's all wavy? This one may have been a lava rock that got squeezed really hard. And it, cr it scrunched together and it folded up like this. And God makes rocks that way too. This is what's known as a metamorphic rock. And this one is a whole bunch of rocks stuck together. This is called breccia. That's just like mineral deposits and stuff like that. And so this all stuck together. Now, you don't have to remember. You can pass it if you want. Wait, it's the lava that, that... That's not lava. That's a different kind of rock. Stuck together with lava? That one didn't, but lava can do that. So that's a good, that's a good thinking. Now, am I going to expect you all to remember all these different kind of rocks? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> don't worry about it. What I want you to remember is this. God did this, and God did this, and God did this, and God did that, and God did that. God did all that, and that's how God creates things. God is super creative in all the different ways that he can put things together. And you know what else? God made you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and all of you, and all of us. God made us all really special and unique too. God is awesome in the way that he puts things together. And you know what? God loves us, which is pretty cool, huh? All right, let's pray together, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for the way that you put this whole world together, and it's so awesome and so unique, and all the different ways that you do it are just amazing. And we thank you for your great grace that put us in this world so that we can enjoy it. And Lord, you made each one of us unique too and special in our own way. And you love us each so much. We just thank you for your creativity and your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks. You guys can go down to the kids' one. Our next song is called Be Thou My Vision. It's one of my favorite songs. And vision is very important to me. I have a story to share with you about that. Gary and I had a vision that we wanted to add onto our house a sunroom. My vision, it's in my head. Well, first came the pit. Outside our house was a big dirt pit. I didn't fall in. I tripped a few times, but I didn't fall in. Eventually, there was a floor. That was great because now I could sit on it. Yesterday, I have two walls. Just the frame, but I have two walls. And the pit, it was really hard to keep envisioning that sunroom. It really was. The walls, I'm beginning to smile again. I feel much better. Sometimes I think our vision is to follow God. Is it easy? Is it smooth all the way? Not always. But I think this song is very encouraging. 
and I'd like you to stand and sing with us. 545, Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my lot. Be be thou my true word Her with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father child may I be thou in me dwelling and I one with be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, my child may I tower. Raise thou my heavenward, O power. I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou only in my heart, High King of Heaven, my treasure. Thank you, Marianne. That's one of my favorites, too. I'm glad we could sing that. So if you were here last week and uh, recognized the scriptures, you can just use last week's bulletin because it's pretty much the same except for the songs. But uh, I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 for our reading for the sermon today. Beginning in the 14th verse, Paul says to the church there in Ephesus, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. I want you to imagine something this morning. Imagine that you're a part of a brand new church plant. I mean, it's brand new. Just started out, brand new fellowship in town, and, and you're just you're, you're excited to be a part of it. It's in the very early days. They've just started out. Everything is exciting. Everything is new, and the leadership is fantastic. They're on fire. They're preaching and teaching. It's passionate. It's insightful. Everybody's engaged in the worship. They're excited about being there. Outreach. It's thriving. 
New people are coming all the time, joining every day. And every Sunday is just busting out with energy. That's the way things go at the beginning of things. There's an excitement in these early days that, that just can't be matched once the church settles into a, a pattern and a routine. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than another. It's just that most times, the early days, are filled with that kind of electricity. So this is where you're at. And one Sunday, right in the middle of the church's very first capital campaign, they're raising funds and money for the poor. This relatively wealthy member, new member, comes in and offers everything that they've got, the proceeds of the sale of some real estate. They had, a, they had some investments and they sold those off. And they brought this in uh, and offered it to the church. He wants the money to be used for God's glory now, this creates a pretty big stir, obviously, as it normally would. This guy probably didn't want the attention, but there you go. He just wants to do the right thing with his money, but people are watching and they're looking. And some, apparently, think that it might be kind of nice to get some of that attention for themselves. And so the next Sunday, another guy comes forward, another relatively wealthy fellow. He says he wants to give all the profits of the sale of some of his real estate to the church, but this Sunday's different. Instead of joy and celebration at the generosity, there's shock and fear. Because the second man, once he's confronted by the leaders of the church, falls dead on the floor. Now you may recognize this story. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's found in the fifth chapter of Acts. And according to Luke, there was this man, a man from Cyprus, a Levite named Joseph, who had some property and he sold it and gave the entire proceeds to this brand new church. He wanted the money to go to help the poor and it's no wonder that he had the nickname that he has. They called him Barnabas, the son of encouragement. But sometimes people can get jealous of that attention. There was another man who had some property, a man named Ananias who with the consent and full knowledge of his wife, Sapphira, he also sold some property and then gave a portion of that to the church. Now in Acts 5, the story goes that Peter asked him why he had lied <laughs> about the money. Apparently Ananias had told the church that, that the money that he was giving was everything that they had made from the sale. Peter says, you know, it was yours to begin with. It was your property to do with what you want. You could sell it and give part or all. It doesn't matter. It's yours to decide. Why would you come in here and lie about it? After he's struck down and he's hauled out of the place, Sapphira comes in and, and she sticks to the same lie. Yep, she says, that's all of it. That's everything that we made, the whole lot of it on the sale of the property. Everybody knows it's not the truth. And so she follows her husband out the door, feet first. This is a powerful story, isn't it? And it ought to make us more than just a little bit uncomfortable. Now the response to the deception on the surface, it seems a little disproportionate, maybe a little excessive. I mean, it's not like people always tell the truth, right? Peter himself had kind of a spotty record here when it comes to telling the truth, and so what makes this an appropriate response to that kind of sin, that this couple would be struck dead because of their lie? Well, today we're going to talk a little more about this principle of truthfulness. And we'll try to unpack that question. As Carlene said, we've been discussing the practices that we need to embrace as the church, what it takes to live together, in it together, and so we can move more faithfully into fulfilling the calling that God has put on our lives that to be a part of his redemptive plan. Overall, the idea is that we, we, if we don't practice these things, then it's kind of hard for us, if not impossible for us, to really faithfully witness to that transformative power of the Spirit, uh, the redemptive blood of Jesus. If we don't live in the truth of, of God's steadfast love, we don't live there if we don't live out these principles if you remember, the first that we talked about was, the, was the, the principle of gratitude, thankfulness. 
And the scriptures are very clear. Over and over again, they tell us that gratitude, that's the only appropriate response to God's generous abundance. And when we live with gratitude, when we live with thankfulness, it's in a full acknowledgement of our great need and God's grace. It's a message that we're sending to the world. They see it and they recognize it, uh, that they're greedy, they're entitled out there. We operate differently here. Next, we examine the idea of keeping, making and keeping promises, how important that is. See, a community that honors its word, that sticks to it, even though it hurts, as the psalm says, well, that's, that, that community is sending a message that their integrity is so great that their yes really is yes and their no really is no. That is an alternative to the deception and the self-serving uh, nature of the world out there next we looked at forgiveness and in forgiveness when we forgive as we're forgiven that is in stark contrast to a world that that keeps grudges and and nurses bitterness and resentment and and hangs on to a record of wrongs you see where i'm going here i i, I think this is becoming clear i hope it is anyway the church the community of believers that is supposed to be one that lives in contrast to the patterns of the world. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be able to stand out in our difference. It's what Paul is talking about over and over again in his letters when he says that he wants us to put off the old and put on the new. When he says that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds instead of being conformed to the pattern of the world. Jesus himself talked about this when he called us salt and light. We're supposed to be different. And so if you need a guide, something that will kind of help direct you in what you should and shouldn't do, you, you possibly could just look at the world and don't do that. Just do the opposite of what they do and you'll probably be in a pretty good place. But the scriptures give us more than that. Not only do they tell us what we should avoid, they, they lead us towards what we should do. We see it in this passage to the Ephesians. Paul says, avoid these things. You know, be wary of the deceitful scheming and the trickery of the world. And instead, do this. Be truthful to each other. Speak the truth in love, he says. Being truthful is one of those ways that we, we grow in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Now, Paul didn't come up with this stuff on his own. This is something that, that he'd heard from others. He may be echoing John here, who called Jesus, uh, said he was full of grace and truth at the beginning of his gospel, chapter 1. And Jesus himself said a similar thing. He, he identified the Spirit of God, the Spirit that was on him, as a Spirit of truth in John chapter 14, in John chapter 15, in chapter 16. Over and over again, we see it. Truth is a hallmark of God's character. And it shows up in the Father's character, it shows up in the Son's character, and in the character of that advocate, the promised Spirit. We see it. And because we live in this place, in, this, this, uh, in the abundance of the Spirit of truth, then it's supposed to be a characteristic of the church as well. The Spirit-filled people of God who are saved by the blood of Jesus. We are people of truth. You're with me so far, right? So it makes pretty good sense. I want you to think about being a people of truth in contrast to the way the world works. The world, it uses truth only when it's convenient, okay? It, or when it benefits them. Truth gets twisted. It gets spun. It's contorted until it becomes almost unrecognizable. We even have words for it now. We say things like false news or alternative facts as if there could be such a thing. Advertisers are great at this. I mean, they lean way into it fast and loose with the truth. And we ourselves, sometimes we're tempted to keep our distance from the truth, only using it when it promises not to hurt us too much. But that's not the pattern that the church is supposed to follow. The story that we saw at the beginning, the one, uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, that proves that. Maybe that's why the Spirit led Luke to record it, to write it down. Maybe that's why it happened in the first place. I mean, think about this. If, 
at the very beginning of the church, in its very earliest days, just maybe a few weeks after Jesus returned to the Father, what if the church had allowed deception and falsehood to slip by without a response? What would that have said about the church? What would it say about the value of truthfulness? How could we claim to live in the spirit, the spirit of truth, if we didn't, from the very beginning of the church, put a premium on truthfulness? Now, I don't want to unpack whether this is all at all fair to Ananias and Sapphira to be turned into an object lesson or an illustration of a truth. Uh, I, I trust God's judgment here, uh, even though I don't fully understand it. But we do learn something from this story, don't we? We see something in this text that truth, generally speaking, is pretty important. And it's really important in the church. So what do we mean when we talk about truth? I'm sure you've got an idea that's kind of percolating in your mind right now. And I want us to, to, to get a hold of that, but then maybe move beyond a, a simplistic understanding of it. Oftentimes when we start out talking about the principle of truth, we think about telling the truth, right? What your parents encourage you to do, tell the truth. Don't lie. Tell the truth. The words that we use, the things that we say, they are factually accurate. That's the truth. Now, people who think about this kind of stuff, the philosophers and the theologians, they call it forensic truth. I kind of like that word. I'm going to use it. You don't have to if you don't want to. It's just being accurate, being factually accurate, forensic truth. It's verifiable. It's evidence-based. It really happened, and I can prove it to you. The cat, the cat knocked over the house plant. Okay, that is a statement of fact. That is the truth. I have evidence to back it up. I'm just using that as an example. Well, kind of. Cats do that kind of stuff. But it's the truth because I have evidence to back up my claim. And I don't want to minimize that. That forensic truth is important, particularly in the time that we're living in right now. There's a troubling pattern out there. If you haven't noticed it, it's there. See, if we start questioning the truthfulness of factual, evidence-based stuff, then we're, we're kind of in trouble. We don't know what ground we're standing on when we do that. We've unmoored ourselves from, from any kind of forensic truth, and now whatever you want to believe, from whatever source you want to, you want to listen to, that becomes what we, what we think is true. It's what's convenient, it's what's beneficial, it's what, what moves our agenda forward, gives us what we want. Social media, oh man, Social media is great. I'm including Facebook in here, folks. Those of you, oh, well, not Facebook. Yes, Facebook. And TikTok and Twitter and all of that. Social media is fantastic about untethering us from the forensic truth. And with forensic truth, I'm going to tell you this, there can really only ever be one truth. There's only one way that things happened. Now, do we have access to that? Probably not. We, our, our perception is limited. We may never really fully get a hold of what really happened or what really is going on, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. It doesn't mean that there isn't a single forensic truth. And we do, folks, have a responsibility to work towards that single truthful account of what happened, regardless of how much it may go against what we want. But we need to go further than this. As a church, we need to move beyond just factual, forensic sort of truth-telling. When we make it just about facts, about just this is what happened, then truth can become something of a weapon that we use to, to beat others into doing what we want them to do. Truth becomes punitive. We use it to, 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 to punish people. It's a lever that we move, use to move things according to our purpose. Here's what I'm getting at with that. When Paul says to us that we need to tell the truth in love, we might be pretty doggone good about telling the truth, but sometimes we're not so good about that love part. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of this once in a while. 
Truth becomes confrontational. It becomes divorced from compassion. It's meant to punish the wrong that others do and does little to move them towards wholeness. So, forensic, factual truth is important, but the intent with which we use it is even more important. What heart motivates our application of that truth? Well, this is where the deeper truthfulness comes in. Paul talks about building up the body. So are we using truth to build up the body or are we using it to tear it apart? Is truth such a part of our life together that we actually are truth full, full of truth? Truthfulness is connected to trust. When we tell the truth, we contribute to building a community, to building a body of trust. The Hebrew word that's often translated as truth in the King James is emeth. The word carries with it also the, the idea of faithfulness, of reliability. The idea of emeth is being trustworthy, it's being truthful, it's being reliable. See, and that doesn't get built once in a while. There's a consistency to the expression of truth. The truthful person doesn't just tell the truth on occasion, when it's convenient, when it's beneficial. They are consistently truthful. And therefore, they become consistently trustworthy, consistently reliable. This is what we're building in the church. This is what the body is meant to be. You get it, right? Follow along here. When we're called to be a community that tells the truth, it's not just so that we, we can use that forensic facts to move our agenda along and further our ends, although we are committed to being as factually accurate as we can possibly be. Instead, we're also more deeply committing to being trustworthy, being reliable, being that community that, that tells the truth consistently, one that lives with such integrity that people can look at that community as the arbiter, as the one who decides and dispenses and tells truth, both factual truth and spiritual truth. Is that what the church is? Well, I think telling the truth, uh, being truthful, plays out in two, two different ways. We do need to tell the truth, right? That's, again, that's what your parents told you, right? Tell the truth. We need to tell the truth. The second part, we need to receive the truth. Why is it that the church, the, the one place where, church, where truth should be evident all the time why is it that we have a hard time with this? I mean, right away, <laughs> right away, not more than a few days after the church began, not more than just a little while after Pentecost, right away you got this couple trying to pull a fast one. Ananias and Sapphira, they illustrate the way that falsehood gets into the community that's supposed to be fundamentally shaped by the spirit of truth. In their story, we see greed. We see selfishness. They wanted the credit for their generosity without paying the price. They wanted their cake, and they wanted to eat it too. That sort of deceptiveness, that's pretty common in the human interactions. We're almost hardwired to go there, to tell stories that paint us in a favorable light, even when they're maybe not as true as they, as they could be. So in the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we, we hear the Spirit telling us, be sure to tell the truth. It's important. <laughs> it's, it's how you're going to protect yourself against that pride and that self-service and do what's right for the body. Tell the truth. But there's another challenge here in the story. Because Ananias and Sapphira aren't the only ones who needed to tell the truth. Peter, along with the rest of the apostles, they also needed to tell the truth. Now this one gets a little bit 
uncomfortable for me, I have to be honest. Too often, leaders in 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 a misguided desire for harmony and peace were reluctant to exhort and encourage, that's the biblical language for telling the truth, We're reluctant to exhort and encourage each other with that truth. I want to think about it. What would have happened to the church if Peter had heard the voice of the Spirit saying, he's lying, Ananias is lying. If he had heard that that Spirit's voice and then ignored it, (laughs) pretended like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to rock the boat here. I don't want to cause any waves. What would that have done to the church? Now, in the interest of telling the truth, I'm going to confess. I struggle with this, personally. I'm not big on confrontation. I don't like to confront. And and to be fair, not every issue demands some kind of an apostolic uh, response. But there are certainly times when I personally shy away from telling people what they should hear just because the truth is uncomfortable. People treat each other poorly sometimes. And I'm reluctant to call them on it because you know, it makes me uncomfortable. I hope they'll hear it some way, some way in, the, in the sermons, in the newsletter articles, in the teaching in the class. But you know, sometimes the truth needs to be a little more directed than that. And I know I'm probably not the only one that struggles with this. If we learn anything in the church, it's that we're supposed to be nice, Right? And sometimes, frankly, that niceness overrules telling the truth. Now, there's nothing going on here that, to my knowledge, is any, any kind of a really seriously terrible stuff. It's just that low-grade general things that we, we have where we're trying to deal with each other and live in community. But I think about this. What if that sort of reluctance grows or is never addressed. What, it's the same kind of reluctance to confront bad behavior in our sisters and our brothers that it's exactly what leads to a loss of credibility for the church. We lose our trustworthiness when we don't tell the truth. On a big scale, this is the kind of behavior that sweeps those incidences of child abuse and sexual immorality and embezzlement and malfeasance under the rug in churches until they frankly blow up in our faces, which they will. Is the church that doesn't tell the truth credible, reliable, trustworthy? If the church fudges on building permits and and tax forms, then how can it be trusted with the gospel? Because the world is watching. They know how truthful we are. We need to tell the truth. And we need to receive the truth. Now this may be the harder part. It's why telling the truth has gotten to be so difficult for us. Truth has to be worked out in a trusting relationship. There's a, there's a reciprocity to it where we give and we take. If we want to build a community that is founded on integrity, that is fundamentally reliable and trustworthy, then we need a way to express the truth. We need a way to be open to the truth. Even when it's a truth that doesn't make us look good. Again, the problem is the pride that is so evident in Ananias and Sapphira. In their story, they fully embraced that lie. They stuck to it all the way to the bitter end. They were not open to the truth that Peter had to share with them. They could not receive that truth, and for them, it was fatal. Rejecting truth always has consequences. Now, I know why we're resistant. We don't like to hear others pointing out our flaws. Well, raise your hand if you do, if you like, if you like other people pointing out your flaws. Well, I'm not going to raise my hand. I don't like it. We don't like to be corrected. We don't like to be exhorted. Again, that biblical language. And frankly, we've had our fill of other people butting in and telling us how we need to do things. 
telling us what they want from us. I mean, what makes them think that they're so smart and that they know best? I get it. As human beings, we're, we're going to have a hard time reaching that truth. We're going to only ever approximate the truth, even with the best of intentions. And so the truth that we tell needs to come with a full measure of humility. But just because we're imperfect about the way that we grab and try to express the truth, just because the, we have imperfection as truth tellers, it shouldn't create a barrier to receiving the truth. I think you get what I'm saying here. One reason that we struggle with telling the truth is that others reject the truth. They don't want to hear it. We make a very careful and a very loving attempt to help a sister or a brother overcome something in their life. And what happens is they all get up in our grill and they, they get all defensive and they make counter accusations and they pitch a fit. And it's not always the case, but often... The level of defensiveness is a reflection of how close to the bone that truth cuts. Regardless, nobody wants to walk into a buzzsaw, and so we just keep it to ourselves. We decide that ignoring the truth is preferable. You see this in the news all the time. <laughs> You've probably got several examples in your head as we speak. Before the truth even comes out, there's already damage control happening before they're, 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 we're filling up the space with noise and smoke. It's a way that we avoid accountability. And we need to be accountable, particularly in the church, because we're responsible to each other. So how open are we to the truth that others may tell us? Can we receive it? We are in this together. Not only are we going to spend this life together as sisters and brothers in Christ, but we're going to spend eternity together. We really are in this together. And so we have a relationship with each other that transcends all of our self-centered desires, everything that we want out of life, our personal comfort. So we need to be open to each other. And we need to tell the truth to each other. Only by opening ourselves to the truth, only by willing to let that truth pinch and pull our sinful selves, cutting out what should not be, so that what should be can grow in its place. Only then are we going to be the body of Christ. Our openness to the church, our willingness to receive or openness to the truth, our willingness to receive the truth that we need to hear, that's going to give permission to our sisters and brothers to speak that truth. And it's going to shape us together into a community of integrity and reliability, a community that carries the gospel, the most important message that anybody could ever hear in a trustworthy way. Because people are hungry for the truth, folks. They've been lied to and lied to and lied to. And they want the truth. And those people will come to us because we live in the truth. We're shaped by the truth. And we practice the truth. See, as a body that is full of the spirit of truth, whose, whose head is full of grace and truth in Jesus Christ. That body has to be truthful. So be open. Let down your guard a little bit. Be willing to receive the truth, even if it's a truth that you don't want to hear. Let that truth do its work in you. And also be willing, with, a, with an abundant measure of humility and love, be willing to speak the truth. Because this is what we are made for. And it's how we are made. And it's who we're meant to be. Pray with me. God of truth. There is much that we would like to keep hidden squirreled away in the dark 
out of prying eyes. Because frankly, it's just not something that we're too proud of. Whatever it is. We fear the truth. Lord, we pray that you would give us courage, strength to withstand, to bear, to be shaped by the truth. The truth that you reveal to us through your spirit, but also the truth that our sisters and brothers may need to speak to us. Help us be open. And Lord, we pray too that you would give us the courage that we need to speak that truth in love and humility and compassion, but truthful nonetheless. Lord, we want to be the body knit together with the ligaments that we've been equipped with. We want to function as we should. And we know that we cannot do this without being truthful. You have given us a great responsibility. We carry the gospel, the message of salvation. And we want people to believe it. So help us to be believable, reliable, trustworthy, and truthful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. That was a powerful message. Let us now sing about going out in peace, being truthful. Please stand. It's hymn number 428. Bow with me once again. Lord, we want to ask a special blessing today on the Extreme Tour as they continue to spread your word into the world that is so desperately in need of it. Help them have courage and strength to tell the truth as well. We pray that you would shelter them and protect them as they travel. Give them what they need. Help us to be generous in our support of them. We just thank you for bringing them together with us so that we might see how broad and wide your kingdom is. Lord, we also pray for Brethren Voluntary Service and the BVS volunteers that are at Camp Stover. We pray for healing uh, for those, uh, the one that has COVID, and, and we pray that the, the virus would not spread and that they would all be in full health. Uh, we pray for protection as they work there and, and a blessing on the work that they will do as they disperse uh, to these many different places in the world. And Lord, we ask a blessing on these, your people, here today. We ask that you would keep them safe, give them opportunities to share your love. And Lord, help us to be a people of integrity. We pray for those that can't be with us. We ask that you would bless them as well. And gather us together again so that we may praise and worship you. We long for that soon. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.